And I mean, I have to go back just a little bit to say that uh, after World War II, the, um, the victors had to figure out what to do with the spoils of the Japanese empire. And Japan had colonized Korea uh, prior to World War II um, and had r rather brutally had run it as a kind of vassal state of, of the Japanese empire. And uh, so kind of sitting around the negotiating table, uh, the, the Soviets under Stalin said, well, we want, we want Korea. It's pretty close to the Russian Far East. And uh, we didn't want to allow them to have all of Korea. Um, so somebody decided to, there just happened conveniently to be the 38th parallel, which is just goes right across the kind of the waist, the middle of, um, of the Korean Peninsula. Arbitrary line, um, a completely random kind of geopolitical decision was made by diplomats. Um, and it was a tragic decision because Korea was one society, one language, one culture. There's really no difference, or at least there was not then, any difference between North and South. Um, they wanted to be one country and they, you know, they should be one country. But anyway, this line was drawn just as lines were drawn uh, through Berlin. Remember, there was all these sectors of Berlin after World War II to yeah. placate and, uh, what, whatever the Soviets might want. And the, and the Soviets uh, sort of got North Korea and we got South Korea. So we were pledged to defend South Korea when Kim Il-sung invaded. And uh, it took us a while to scramble the troops together and get the Marines over there. Uh, and um, we pushed a, after an amazing operation called the Incheon Invasion, uh, um, Amphibious Landing at Incheon, uh, which was one of the highest moments of, of MacArthur's military career. Um, pushed Kim Il-sung back to the 38th parallel and beyond. And, you know, we, if we just done that and just said, that's it, war's over, uh, it would have saved millions of lives, millions, billions of dollars. And uh, the war would have ended up exactly where it ended up anyway, which is the 38th parallel, <laughs> which is kind of a sad and tragic irony. But I think what happened was that MacArthur got a little greedy and he started saying, well, let's not just push him back to the 38th parallel. Let's push him all the way back to Manchuria. Let's unite all of Korea under our regime. Uh, let's, let's essentially do what Kim was trying to do, but do it in reverse and, and push, push Kim out uh, and take it, take it all. And we started to do just that, pushing north, north, north towards the Yalu River, which is the border with Manchuria which is which is china mm -hmm. um, so the chinese start to get very nervous uh oh here come the americans pushing north towards our border uh maybe we need to enter the war and so that essentially is what the chosen reservoir battle is all about it's it's the moment when the chinese in full force enter the war and they stream across that yellow river uh, under cover of night this is what they're really good at because they are essentially a guerrilla army. They, they can preserve the element of surprise and, and camouflage and they don't need roads because they, don't, they are not a mechanized army. They're, they're a foot army. They, they're on foot and they also have, you can believe it, uh, camels and uh, really? shaggy horses, these Mongolian ponies. Uh, but they don't, hmm. they are very difficult to spot from the air. Um, so the intelligence uh, that MacArthur's intelligence was quite flawed and we, we, we didn't realize that they had come across in such large numbers until it was almost too late. And uh, so what, uh, Hampton, what were those large numbers that we're talking about here? Because, I mean, it's, it is a, it's like a peasant force. I mean, is that, it's not really an yeah. organized military per se, as I understand it. Well, it, and, it's more organized than you might think. Um, okay. Don't forget that the, um, that Mao, um, had just recently won the civil war in China. Mm -hmm. um, and Mao, for all of his weirdness uh, as, and, and all of his, uh, you know, later uh, under his regime, all his cruelty and brutality, um, he was a very effective uh, military tactician. Uh, he was very actively involved in planning this in, uh, 
uh, if you want to call it invasion. Uh, and he, um, it was mainly the Ninth Army, it was called the Ninth Army Group that came across, but we're talking about 350,000 uh, with another million or so waiting still in Manchuria, getting ready to, to cross. Um, they were a little more organized than you might think. It's just that they were not a traditional army in the sense that they, they didn't have tanks. They didn't have uh, motorized vehicles to, to speak of. They didn't have an air force to, um, to give them um, support from the air. They didn't have a Navy. <laughs> um, they were a ground force, a guerrilla ground force, and they were quite effective with, with their mortars and with small artillery. Um, but really what they were about was numerical superiority and the element of surprise because they moved only at night. They only fought at night. Uh, that's because they were terrified of American air power. Sure. sure. Uh, and they also um, didn't have sufficient weapons. So sometimes what they would do is they would they would come in at night and they would they would they would attack, um, and the first wave would have weapons, but they would get mowed down. And so the second wave was supposed to come. They didn't have weapons. They would pick up the weapons of those who had been mowed down and continue the charge. Uh, and you know, if you look, it, one way to look at this, of course, is that Mal was willing to use his men as cannon fodder. He was willing to sustain a level of casualties that we would think we would consider obscene. Sure. You know, just like, uh, uh, yes, they were brave, uh, or maybe yes, they were just terrified of their um, their superiors uh, who told them, go march, you know, just like, go, go, you know, march into battle without a weapon. <laughs> Unbelievable. To get into some of that, the confusing aspects of there, something I always thought was interesting was this dynamic. I'm hoping you could add some light to this, but mm -hmm. China didn't enter the war. It was a volunteer army, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Whereas this, I guess it projected forward, it was this deniability of Chinese involvement in a weird way. No, well, that was, it, they, that was their public statement is that, oh, we didn't enter the war. Um, these are volunteers who just, Oh, we'll just pick up rifles and and go um, help out our brethren to the south in, uh, in across the Yalu River. That's not true at all. They were they, they it was Mao's army and it was run by Mao and his generals, mm -hmm. and uh, they were had been preparing prior to this to invade, you know, and they were they were planning an amphibious invasion of Taiwan, um, and. Uh, which was then called Formosa, but it's, you know, Taiwan, which is still an issue today. Like there's always the fear that China is going to reclaim <clears throat> Taiwan. They never acknowledged that um, Chiang Kai-shek and his forces uh, legitimately, you know, could have Taiwan. Uh, so they were planning this sort of trop this uh, war in a tropical, um, on a tropical island. They were wearing, you know, essentially pajamas and little sneakers uh, with no socks. When they got they got the call to say, no, we're not going to Taiwan. We're gonna go up to North Korea and in the winter and we'll fight. And so consequently, so many of these poor Chinese soldiers uh, were hor horrifically ill-equipped for battle. And um, I mean, we were too, the American troops were too, but wow, the Chinese, I mean, like they didn't have socks. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't have gloves. Um, a lot of them and um you know so uh so no but no but that was good get back to your question they did mal did as a kind of political cover he he, he would he would argue that this was not an official action on our part this is uh these are volunteers i mean um, we laugh about that now was it did people at the time were they able to like did truman just say yeah whatever um i think we saw right through it pretty right. quickly and, and what happened was, you know, we, we started having some early skirmishes with forces that we thought were North North Koreans. And it turned out they were, because we'd capture some and we would interrogate them. Uh, 
on the battlefield and learn that no, they're they're Chinese and they would they're pretty forthcoming actually. Like yeah, we're we're from the Ninth Army Group or whatever, and uh, this is our unit, and we're we're from China. <laughs> we're Chinese, and there's about a hundred, or two hundred, or maybe three hundred thousand behind us. Uh, so, you know, and and that's a, a big part of the the book. Um, the early going, I try to really examine why did we have this massive, such a massive intelligence failure? Um, uh, you know, how did how did it happen that we did not know that there were so many hundreds of thousands of Chinese soldiers who had flooded across the border and gotten into these positions? And even when we, we, we when the intelligence was coming in uh, and it was pretty loud and clear, why did we ignore that intelligence for so long? Uh, and and um, well, the, the answer to those questions, all, all roads lead to Tokyo and General MacArthur and his yes men who didn't want to believe this. It, it was an inconvenient narrative. They didn't want to know about it. Uh, they just wanted to march to the Yalu and get the war over. And um, uh, they, they willingly ignored this intelligence. And I even think they, you know, there, there's plenty of evidence that they actually covered it up uh, for a while. Um, and, um, you know, I think it's indicative of the, the phenomenal power that MacArthur had at that point. I don't know that there's ever been a time in American history when, we, when more power was concentrated in one man and sure. on one man's, uh, office. And, and, you know, because MacArthur was not only leading the occupation, but he was the, the, the leader of, of, of the American forces in the, in the Far East. He was the commander of the UN, all UN forces. Uh, and he was, you know, potentially running for president. Uh, that was the great fear is that he was going to run for president. And so people back in Washington, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Secretary of Defense and uh, Secretary of State and, and certainly Truman were all kind of terrified of MacArthur and his ego and you know, what would he do? What would he say? Um, so um, this intelligence failure happened just in the simplest terms because of, of the unique personality uh, and, and all the power that this one man uh, had. An emperor. An emperor. Yeah. Who was near, you know, he was a little past his um, expiration date. Uh, you know, he was getting on up there in years. He didn't like, you know, traveling much. He liked his creature comforts there in Tokyo. He never slept a single night on the ground in Korea. Uh, so, I mean, I guess you could say by by definition, he was an absentee general. Um, uh, he'd come that's over hard for to, a photo op and then he'd fly back. Um, that's hard to grasp. It'd be so easy to do. It'd be, you know, a mistake and you could spend a night in Korea, right? Um, yeah. And he's army commanding Marines on the ground, telling yeah. them to do things. I mean, that's an incredibly, that's a big nuance here too, that those guys on the ground, everyone's suffering from these decisions. They're suffering from the leadership making decisions. They're suffering from sick offense, you know, sucking up to anybody and everybody to stay in power. These intelligence mm -hmm. failure and the yes men. Mm -hmm. And just back to the story itself on desperate ground is still to me, it's the story of the grunt having to suffer through these yeah. just terrible decisions that were made for them in a lot of ways yeah. that placed them there. And these were the guys we, some of those stories are just so incredible about that guy from, I think, Georgia that also was on Iwo Jima and he was a platoon leader, found himself in Korea, holy smokes. But a lot of the people, they were still that World War II experience, right? Those were their older brothers who did it, who fought good versus evil. And, you know, and they never had the chance because they were 12 or something. And so you're idolizing your older brothers, your older right. cousins your younger uncles and yeah. and this is sort of their shot to you know red white and blue liberty freedom america communism you know mm -hmm. defeat all of that sort of stuff yeah. and but then they find themselves in negative 30 degrees with you know the commanding general doesn't even have a freaking clue what's going on because he's in a whole different country right now right yeah, yeah absolutely you know i think uh, with with the first marine division you had this unique situation where you had a very young green um, uh, fighting force. These were the younger brothers and cousins of, of World War II vets. Um, they, they, many of them had trained like 
whilst on the on the warships coming across the Pacific that were getting their basic training, you know, yeah. doing target practice off the side of the boat. Um, but as green as they were, they were the, the officers, um, the non-coms and the platoon leaders, and uh, they were veterans of World War II and those worst battles of the Pacific mm -hmm. theater. And so you have a very well-led, a very experienced um, uh, officer corps uh, running r w with these very green, uh, young, um, uh, fledgling uh, troops. So it's an interesting dynamic there. Uh, they 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 got experience in a hurry though, <laughs> in a real yeah. hurry. I mean, I, in a way, I sort of personally relate to that with the whole GWAT thing that we were in because by the time we were in, it was almost ten years into it, in mm -hmm. a sense. And so you had a lot of the, you know, coming in as a platoon leader as a young 24, 25 year old. Half the people had combat deployments under their belt, right? The team leaders, the squad leaders, platoon. Everybody is very well versed in combat. Yeah. Uh, two, three years of really bad experiences, like the Fallujah timeframes and all that, is a part of this. And mm -hmm. um, but you're still taking orders from the top, and it's yeah. like, you don't yeah. know who's coming up with those orders and yeah. what really should we be doing on the ground? Is this even doing anything? Uh -huh. um, so we were lucky to have that sort of experience, but I still view it and. Unfortunately, similar terms because these aren't good things. I don't think that we're talking about this sort of um, disconnection between those at the top and then those on the ground actually doing the job. Yeah, and so so with the chosen reservoir, you have this you know in the middle of all this, trying to sort it all all out. You have this amazing general, Gen General Smith, Oliver Prince Smith, who commander of the First Marine Division, who. Weeks before it seems like everyone else, he sees a battle coming. He sees this is not good. We're marching into the this wilderness on this single road that's a serpentine road. You know, every hairpin turn is another opportunity for an ambush. Uh, uh, everything he's been taught, uh, all his instincts are at, on high alert. And um, he, of course, Marines don't even like to get away from the ocean. You know, they're they're amphibious creatures. <laughs> mm -hmm, Here sure. we are way up in the mountains. And yeah. um, so he starts planning against the, the, the judgment of all the his superiors, especially MacArthur, uh, for a battle. And, and so he's like, well, if we're going to have a battle. We need a headquarters. We need to build uh, essentially a citadel in the, in, the, in the wilderness somewhere where we can have our supplies and our ammunition and our food. And we need to build an airstrip because there is no airstrip <laughs> where are we going to get how are we going to get the food and, and supplies and ammo in and how are we going to get the casualties out and they're like what do you mean casualties what casualties there's not going to be casualties you know there's not going to be a battle so almost against almost to the point of insubordination general mm -hmm. smith has to plan for a battle you know because what he's doing is looking after his own men this is you know this is what a field commander has to do He's, he's not so concerned about the larger strategy. He's con he wants to protect his own men, um, mm -hmm. yeah. and and yet still keep marching north because that's what the orders are. So yeah. he's he is really sorting through a lot of. He's in a tough position. He's between a rock and a hard place, and uh, he decides uh, this place called Hagaru um, is is going to be the place for his headquarters for the airstrip. They dig this. The, the engineers dig this airstrip out of the frozen dirt and um, working 24 seven, you know, under the these floodlights, uh, fighting off the Chinese as they literally they're like on a tractor or on a bulldozer with a, with a rifle in their hand, you know, and you know, I think the kind of the unsung hero of this whole narrative, in many ways were the engineers, the battle engineers who built bridges mm. and rebuilt bridges and built this airstrip and, and did a lot of other amazing things under very difficult circumstances. So they do build this airstrip that's just barely long enough to accommodate some larger planes to get supplies in and yes, to get those casualties out. And there are, I've forgotten the number now, but many, many, many thousands of Marines and, and other soldiers who were, who were injured, who got out on, on that airstrip and really owe their life to the decisions that General Smith made. This is why General Smith is like revered like you know like a god among the the marines um for 
having the foresight, uh, you know, he was almost, I don't want to say he was clairvoyant. I think he, he but he, he saw that a battle was going to happen. And he, he, you know, he, it was a trap, you know, they were surrounded mm. and um, he had to plan for it. And he did. I just kind of wonder what that would look like on the ground. So you've got the, the ground commander who understands what's happening to your point, maybe a little clairvoyant, but the higher commanders that are completely missing everything, that's a theme. I feel like every war has that to some degree. Yeah. I wonder if it was different, right? If, if the higher level commander really had it nailed and the guy on the ground didn't, mm -hmm. how much different does that turn out? But yeah. yeah, lucky to have had Smith. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he was the right guy in the right place, the right time. Um, he had been through hell and back with, uh, in, during World War II. Um, and he was a very cautious guy, a very, very meticulous planner. Um, interesting guy in and of himself. He, they called him the professor. And, you know, he's kind of an intellectual. He wasn't your typical rah-rah macho Marine dude. He was like this um, very calm, cerebral guy who raised, you know, like roses in his spare time. <laughs> and you know smoked a pipe and had, he was fluent in french and he traveled all over the world and uh, he read and during the heat of battle he'd be reading like some classic battle narrative he loved military history uh and when he retired he you know he just worked in his garden and planted roses and read all the time so in interesting guy um he was a graduate of berkeley of all places <laughs> uh so um i love just as a Purely as a character, he, he's, he's amazing to me and uh, kind of uh, goes against type. Even though he was a Marine's Marine, he was not your typical macho, um, you know, attack, attack, attack kind of Marine. Now, there was one of those guys um, also in this battle, uh, another famous Marine, maybe the most uh, uh, famous Marine of all time, uh, and that's Chesty Puller, uh, who was, who was, um, in this battle and he was chesty puller was one of these you know i mean i think he was the most decorated marine of all time that's right yeah 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 he, uh, he was attack 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 you know and he was a great and very forceful person to have um on the, on the battlefield um he he has famously said all kinds of things during this <laughs> he, so he was just immensely quotable and and the, the, the yeah the war correspondents loved Chesty Puller because it's everything that came out of his mouth was was ready for for print. Uh, and he said, um, well, one of the things that happened was that um, they kept dropping supplies down um, in the battlefield. He was at a place called Coterie uh, and uh, they kept dropping condoms. <laughs> Yeah, and it was like I said, 35, you know, 30 below zero weather. Uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of uh, R&R &R going on. Yeah. Uh, why? And, he, and Chesty Puller said, condoms? What the hell they think we're doing to these Chinese? <clears throat> and and he also said, uh, you know, you've got to report at one point. It's like, Chesty, uh, you know, the Chinese are every, we're completely surrounded by overwhelming numbers of Chinese. And he goes... Well, so the Chinese, let me see if I understand you right. The Chinese are to the north of us and, and to the south, and then they're to the east and, and to the west. Well, that's great. Now they can't get away from us now. <laughs> It'd be an entire book of just the stuff he said. Polarisms, yeah. Yes.